instead of giving you my opinion, again, we're reading what the Word of God says. Now, uh, as the uh, rabbi had mentioned about abominations, let me, let me point this out. So what about all the other abominations? Some of you that might can quote the scripture can talk about, well, the Bible calls eating shrimp and pork an abomination. It says not to uh, be with your wife during her menstrual cycle. That's an abomination. Well, so how do we, you know, why do we call homosexuality abomination and perhaps I might eat shrimp or pork? Here's the answer to that. The prohibition against homosexuality was based on God's universal practice. Moral laws, meaning, meaning laws for all people in all times. The prohibition against eating shrimp or whatever, pork, what, so forth, was a ritual requirement for ancient Israel, according to the scripture listed in Leviticus 18. Some such things as dietary laws were just for Israel, according to the Leviticus chapter 11. But we know after Jesus came, also, this is kind of skipping around, but for time's sake here, just to get the point across, we know that after Jesus came, we kept some of the Old Testament law and disregarded other parts of the Old Testament law. But we understand that these are all God's universal laws. So you also find that there was no death penalty for eating shrimp or the alike. But there was for homosexuality in the Old Testament. Don't, you know, uh, be upset with the messenger. I'm just, you know, just to tell you, you know, I'm just presenting the word of God. The New Testament does not impose Israel's dietary laws on people, but it does forbid all sexual acts outside of marriage. Jesus said nothing we can eat can make us unclean, but of course all kinds of sexual immorality can make us unclean, according to Mark 7 and Matthew 14. The bottom line is according to Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20. That God judged nations for these sins and God abhorred nations for committing these sexual acts. Now, the rabbi happened to mention that this is not the red flag issue. Well, you know, that's the, the, maybe the Jewish perspective. But from the Christian perspective, this is a major red flag issue. And let me explain why. As I said, God judged nations for these things. So why, why, why would I, many Christians be opposed to uh, you know, gay marriage and gay rights laws such as the so-called human rights ordinances and anti-discrimination ordinances. I don't have time to get into that because that's not what we're really talking about, but it's really not about discrimination. But uh, let's read this. Why are we would be against those things? We understand that God will judge people in the nations upon according to the, the what the people, you know, whether or not the people keeps his word. And I can prove that. Psalms 19 and 17 says this. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalms 33 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is Lord and the people whom he hath chosen with his own inheritance. Proverbs 14. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, so that's the Old Testament. The rabbi happened to say that he doesn't, you know, the, the, the Jewish faith doesn't take into account the New Testament. So I'm going to get into the New Testament. So what does the New Testament and Jesus himself say about the issue of homosexuality? Some say Jesus had nothing to say about homosexuality. This is false. And I'll prove that. Jesus said he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And as uh, as proved, the law forbid homosexual practice. Now, Jesus specifically reaffirmed that in, in Matthew 19. Let me read that. Matthew 19 and 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning, here's those words, male and female, and said, For this call shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall twain be one flesh. Wherefore... Uh, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Jesus also spoke against sexual immorality in Mark chapter 7. But moving on towards the uh, end of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, verse 9. Ye, know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Okay, listen to all these points. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate. Notice that word. 
nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Here he's referring to homosexual acts. Verse 11, and such were some of you. So this is, by the way, this is the Apostle Paul writing uh, to the people at Corinth. And he said, such were some of you. But notice what he said here. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by his spirit. They, there is hope. They overcome. They confess their, their sin. 1 Timothy says this, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners, the unholy and the profane. Notice what verse 10 says. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. Here we, we hear that again. For those that defile themselves with mankind. Referring again to homosexual practice. And for time's sake, we're going to move on. Romans chapter 1 says this. I want to pay close attention here. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Okay, this is getting directly into the conversation of homosexuality, and this is in the New Testament. Who, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the cre creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now here it is. Verse 26, for this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. God is saying this, you know, homosexual activity is against nature. And likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. Now, basically what this is saying is that the men, you know, uh, were lusting after each other. And when it says that recompense of their error, they were getting their due judgment uh, for that. And which, you know, in other words, the physical aspect of this, which we haven't even talked about. Uh, homosexuality and how dangerous that is from a science or, or you know, physical aspect, the disease and so forth. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, mal maliciousness, uh, full of envy, murder, debate. Uh, this goes on, so I know I'm running out of time. But it lists a whole host of things here. Verse 32, and knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So they're saying that not only are you doing it, but you have to take pleasure in others doing it. So getting close to closing, I know I've been lengthy. As to what causes homosexual desires from a biblical standpoint, or biblically speaking. Uh, now obviously there's a lot of things that can cause. Listen, by the way, I do not deny the real desire of any one being for same-sex attraction. We're not denying that. Most of the time, factually and statistically, it comes from abuse and molestation, but there can be other reasons, you know. Okay. But from a biblical standpoint, you can laugh if you want to, but that's okay. Let's talk to the Bible. What does the Bible say about how, why these things take place? Mark chapter 7 says this, verse 20, And he said, To which cometh out of the man that defileth the man, for from within, out of the heart, men proceeding evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Here's the point. Verse 23. All these things come from within and defile the man. The heart's deceitfully wicked, it also says. Who can know it? So these, these evils are coming out of mankind and out of our own lust. Now, James uh, chapter 1 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust, whatever that is. Obviously, I'm a 33-year-old single male. You don't think that I struggle to lust after a beautiful woman? Absolutely. So it's out of our own lust that we are enticed, the Bible says. Verse 15, when, uh, Then when lust hath conceived... It bringeth forth sin, 
and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In closing, there is hope, and there is deliverance, and there is forgiveness. Again, God hates no one. Remember, he is willing that none should perish, but all should have everlasting life. Matthew chapter 5 says in verse 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. John uh, chapter 8, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, the Son, meaning the Son of God, he shall be free indeed. And very last statement, Ephesians chapter 4, good hope here, verse 22, says this, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, and this is what happens in the Christian conversion, when you repent and give your heart to Christ, putting off the old conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to its deceitful lust, we keep repeating those words here, the Bible does, and renewed in the spirit of your mind, verse 24, and that ye put on the new man, which God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So even if we do struggle with these things, we can repent. God can deliver and put us in his natural order, and we can go on in his will. I know I've been lengthy, but thank you for my time. God bless.